Good morning, church family. I'm Tom. And I'm Lindsay. We're so happy to have you here in worship this morning. Come and support our young entrepreneurs at the Kids Create Craft Show this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the Esquire parking lot. They've worked hard to create some amazing things, so stop by and shop their products. There will be a new study beginning next Sunday led by Lane Nutt titled Who You Are in Christ. This group will meet at 11 a.m. in room 201. If you have any questions, email Mike Knight or visit the core group sign-up table in the lobby. Next Sunday, we're hosting two amazing classes. Come and learn how to share your faith at the Evangelism Workshop at 12.30 p.m. And if you're interested in getting involved with FBC, there'll be a Discover First class at 4 p.m. Both classes will be in the Fellowship Hall. And ladies, on September 13th, there's new Tuesday night Bible study beginning at 6.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And mark your calendars for the Priscilla Shire simulcast on September 24th. We're excited to present a unique opportunity for our church and community. On October 1st, we'll be hosting an apologetics mini conference on our campus. Our goal is to learn how to engage with people in our community and culture. For more information or to register for any of the events we've mentioned, check out our website at fbcbolivar.org. And stay up to date with our social media by following at First Baptist Bolivar on Facebook and Instagram. Just a reminder that our ministry offices will be closed tomorrow in observance of Labor Day. If this is one of your first times here, we're so happy to have you here. Please text the word GUEST to 417-282-8322 or visit the info hubs in the lobbies where someone would love to meet you and get you connected at FBC. Now let's begin worship. Good morning, First Baptist, and welcome to our worship this morning. Not only those of you here in the room with me, but online and on the radio, we invite everyone to fully participate in our worship today. We're going to start with the reading of Scripture from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's meditate on that as we stand to sing Christ, our hope in life and death. Oh, 
continue singing together and worshiping the solid rock. Celebrate baptism. Baptized today as a profession of her faith. I'm her father, Phil, and her mother, Sarah, is going to read her testimony. I'm Ruth Kahlberg. I'm six years old and in the first grade. My parents read me Bible stories about Jesus and told me about him. I wanted to ask Jesus in my heart because he forgives my sins, helps me to be good, and to do the right thing. So when I was four years old after breakfast, 
I asked my dad if I could ask Jesus into my heart. This was at our old house on July 18th, 2020. Dad told me what to pray and guided me through asking Jesus in my heart. My mom and grandparents were so happy to hear about this. After this, I prayed and asked God for a baby sister a lot, and God answered my prayer when my baby sister Eden was born. I learned about getting baptized from the Bible stories my parents read me about Jesus getting baptized and from my Sunday school teacher when she taught my class about it. While I was at church, I decided I wanted to be baptized because I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus because he helps me not to disobey and not to sin. He helps me so much whenever I need anything and makes me feel good and happy. Whenever I am worried, he gives me peace. I know Jesus is the Son of God who rose from the dead and forgives my sin. Ruth, is that your testimony? Yes. Have you trusted Jesus alone for your salvation? Yes. Are you ready to follow Jesus and honor him with your life? Yes. Are you here to today to be baptized to demonstrate that Jesus has saved you? Yes. Then Ruth, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Love your nose. One, two, three. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised to a new life. We have the privilege of seeing two more baptisms today. It's actually a uh, son and his father. This is Jaden, and he's coming to be baptized today. And his mother, Brianna, is going to read his testimony. My name is Jaden Reynoso. I am 12 years old, and I'm in the sixth grade at Polk County Christian School. I know that God went in the flesh of Jesus and died for our sins. I was born as a sinner like everyone else, and I want to be a Christian. I asked for forgiveness, and he forgave me. I am a son of God. Jaden, are those words your testimony? Yes. Have you trusted Jesus alone for your salvation? Yes. Are you desiring to follow him as Lord of your life? Yes. And are you being baptized today to demonstrate that you've, uh, you've been saved by Jesus? Yes. Based upon your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lowered with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. And this is Jaden's daddy. This is Fernando, and uh, he's coming to be baptized today as well. And so his wife, Brianna, will be reading his testimony. Hello, my name is Fernando, and I am 31 years old. My life before Jesus was chaotic. I was lost, and I didn't love myself. I was living a life filled with sin and anger. I have always heard stories about Jesus and all he has done for us. I married my wife, Brianna, and her and my in-laws are Christian and brought me with them to church, which brought me close to Jesus. On August 8th, I asked God to forgive me and turn my life away from sin. He forgave me, and I accepted and received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am so happy to be forgiven and grateful for all that I have because of Jesus. Fernando, are those the words of your testimony? Yes. Have you trusted Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation? Do you desire to follow him as Lord of your life? Yes. And are you being baptized today to demonstrate that Jesus has saved you. Yes. Based on your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lowered with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Our focus scripture this morning is here from the word of the Lord as recorded in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? <clears throat> Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life and we just saw that testimony and um, what a wonderful way to tie that scripture in to that act of obedience I'd ask you to stand once again and we will sing of that living hope <clears throat>
depth, the depth of the riches of both the knowledge and the wisdom of God. How unsearchable are your ways and your judgments and unfathomable your ways. Lord, we see that we come to this time of offering that causes us to think back about what we have and what we are all about. I think back through the last few weeks that those of us have been here, we've been reminded by the prophet Haggai of a people. A people who sowed a lot and harvested very little. A people who worked for wages and put those wages in purses that had holes in them. A people that were willing to live in paneled houses while your temple laid in ruin. Boy, there's so many different ways that we identify with that, with those people. It's as if you were talking to us weeks ago and even now. Lord, I look now uh, even further as to what we saw. And what we saw was that a people that would turn to you and be obedient to you, uh, that you could be trusted. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, because you can be trusted. And then I wondered myself, I don't know about others, but I wondered, Lord, I wondered, trusted in what? And then somebody came up with a ministry fair. And so we go to that and we see the many, many things that are opportunities to invest both time and money in and effort. Then the message that day. Yeah. The message that day was about talents. About what you've given us. First thing I remember was that it was said you, everyone has been given something. But there was a difference in those that received the talents, and there's a difference today. Some are burying them, more or less kind of like in the backyard, as some of us. Some, Lord, invested it. So I wonder today, as these plates are passed before us in what can almost seem like just a ritual, if you wouldn't have us, if your desire wouldn't be that we consider what we've been given and where we're supposed to invest it and to make sure that we're just not burying it. Oh, Lord. There is none of us that would say that we have been qualified to give you advice, to give you counsel. And Lord, there's just one thing we know, that all things are from you and through you and to you. So we say at this moment, to you be the glory forever. And all God's people join in saying, Amen.
Take your Bible and join me in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. And as we continue our series called Anchored in Christ, we have a bit of a lengthy passage that we're going to work through together today. We're actually going to look at Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12 through chapter 4 verse 13. As we think about that, let's look as we begin at the first couple verses. This is what the Word of God says. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the defeat, deceitfulness of sin. There are times that I can think about in my life that I would just say to you, I've been tired. I wonder if anybody in the room can relate to that. Several, some of you are saying, well, of course we can. It was a high school student or as a college student, we're two weeks into classes and absolutely we can relate to being tired. To say it another way, there are times in my life that I've longed for rest. And when I say that, there's a, a few instances that really specifically come to mind. One of them was when I was a teenager, I helped my favorite uncle, Uncle Jeb, dig holes for decorative ponds in his backyard by hand. I was physically tired. And then I think about a few years ago when I came back from a mission trip to South Asia and I think of all of the things that I saw and the people that I met and that which I experienced. And when I came home, I was mentally and emotionally tired. But as I think about the times that I've longed for rest, the one that comes to mind maybe the sharpest is when I was 12 years old. And I remember that evening in my grandparents' house in one of their bedrooms. I came to the point where I realized I was a sinner. Sin was pressing down. The weight of sin was pressing down on me. And I needed rest for my soul. And I took everything that I knew about myself and my sin as a 12-year-old, and I gave it to everything I knew about Jesus as Savior. And He saved me, and that night He gave me that rest for which I Longed. I wonder about you. Can you relate? Have you ever needed rest, specifically maybe spiritually? How about now? How about this morning? How about today? I think that perhaps raises several questions for us that are important for us to consider. Number one, what in the world is this rest of which we speak? How do we, how do we get it? How is it available to us? Who is it available to? And is it a guarantee that just simply from the fact that I'm a believer, I, I have it or always have it in its fullest measure? I believe the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today goes a long way to address this theme, this subject, and these questions. So I would like us to look at this passage of Scripture thinking about the theme of rest and really, we will see, I believe, three truths. The first truth we see in chapter 3, verses 12 through 19, and it's this, the hard truth about rest and unbelief. The hard truth about rest and disbelief. Look as I read all of verses 12 through 19. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another today or day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will come hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, not all, did not all of those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were not able to enter 
because of unbelief. This passage begins with an interesting, interesting address, if I can say it that way. It begins with this warning or this command to, to take care or to take heed. Uh, the book of Hebrews, really, we've already seen and we will see, is a book that is chock full of warning passages to the addressee. As a matter of fact, we've already seen and we will continue to see that we are called to pay attention. It's interesting here who it is that's called to pay attention. How are they addressed? Well, here they are addressed as brethren, or we might say brothers and sisters. So whatever else we can say about this passage and whatever else we can say about those who are addressed, we can understand that God's Word here is addressing those who at least seem to be in relationship with Him. Not those who aren't, but those who are in covenant. Those, if I can say it this way, who are a part of the church. Now that's important for us today because we have to understand that at least implied in this is this is this understanding that something is being taught about rest and disobedience and unbelief as it relates not to just those outside the church, but perhaps to those inside the church, or at least that seem to be a part of it. There is a warning regarding rest for the people of God. And, and what is that warning? Take care, take heed, lest you fall away. Now, the, the word that's used here for fall away is actually where in the English language we get our modern-day term and concept of apostatize. And usually we think of apostatize as being just that, leaving the faith. However, in the, the time that the book of Hebrews is written, that's not really how the word is used. I don't say there's any evidence for that, but the word is better translated, rebelled. And so the question becomes, is it, is it possible that even the people of God or those that are a part of the people of God, can they rebel? Well, the answer seems to be yes, to which we respond back, well, well how? Well, well, look again at the first two verses. By an evil, unbelieving heart. We have to take care that we don't have an evil, unbelieving heart. And the great news is verse 13 gives us some encouragement of how we can avoid that. Encourage one another. Now, verse 13 is the first of many one another passages in the book of Hebrews. One scholar has said it like this, and this is so important, yet sometimes so foreign to our American mindset. What we often see in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews is the rebel passage passages are in the singular, meaning addressed to the individual. But the abiding or remaining passages are in the plural or addressed to the church, to the corporate body. The translation of that would be this, and this is so important. What this means is the Bible teaches that no Christian is intended to be an island into or of himself or herself. We are not designed to try to walk this life alone. To say it one more way, there is really no such thing and you are not intended to be a lone ranger Christian. And The reason why may be what we see in verses 14 and 15. Because even for the people of God, even for those that have become partakers in or with Christ, they're there is a warning. There is this implied idea of if we hold fast, firm to our confession until the end. Now, I don't believe, and I've said this before, that's a matter of gaining salvation or losing salvation, but there is something to be said about rest for the people of God and hearing His voice and not hardening His heart. Now, what is really interesting here is that the author here gives us a, a grounds, a reason why that could be true in our life and for the church. And you say, well, what, what are those grounds? Well, once more, it's Psalm 95, that which we saw last week, Psalm 95. Some people have said that Psalm 95 is the Scripture passage and Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 is the sermon. 
And that may be a good way to think of it. There's this passage of Scripture that God has given in the Old Testament, and there's applications even for us today from that passage of Scripture. And so in Psalm 95, here, once again, we see a couple truths that really should shake us to the core. And there's, these truths come to us in rhetorical questions. And the first question for us as we think about the warning to the church is really, who was it in the Old Testament that God became angry with? Who was it that faced his wrath and his anger? Well, verse 16 answers for us, doesn't it? Was it not all of those that were led out of Egypt by Moses? The idea, it was those that were close to God. It was those that were in covenant with God. It was those he redeemed from Egypt. So the idea is if it can happen to them, can it happen to us today? The answer is yes. Which leads to the second question. What was it that led them to this fate, this result in their life? Well, did you catch it? It was, verse 17 and 18, their, their sin, their disobedience. They knowingly knew God's way, but they willingly went their own way. That's the idea. And so we see the conclusion of the matter in verse 19 is very close to the warning that we're given in verse 12. So see that they were not able to enter, meaning his rest, because of what? Unbelief, what we're called to take care that does not happen to us. Now listen, here's what we have to understand. Just simply being close to God, seemingly being in a relationship with God, maybe even being in covenant with God does not necessarily mean we are in his rest the way he desires. It was true for Israel. In honor of college football season being in full swing, and by the way, it's my understanding that our SBU Bearcats won yesterday, and they're now 1-0. But in honor of college football season being in full swing, let's take a page out of the now culturally iconic 1993 movie, Rudy. Bear with me for a moment. You might be aware of that movie. It's about a young man in the 70s by the name of Dan Rudy Rudiger that had this lifelong desire to go to Notre Dame and play on the football team. He had two things working against us. He wasn't any good, and he didn't have the grades to get into Notre Dame. But amazingly, the movie is somehow he gets in, he reaches his dream, he gets on the team, and actually his senior season, he gets into a game and makes the final tackle, which was a sack against Georgia Tech. Now, underneath that main storyline is this subplot that fascinatingly runs through the whole movie. And it's really this. There is this rift between him and his family because they don't support his dream. And really between his dad and his brothers. Now, whoever you think is responsible for the rebellion, there is without a doubt the truth that it is causing a faction and problems with the relationship and them coming together in the movie. So much so that one time he comes home for Thanksgiving and it's so bad he can't even stay, he leaves and goes back. Now, here's the point. If it had been possible at some point to stop after all of that was going on, the rebellion was happening, and take his DNA, would he still have been related to that family? Would he still have been a part of that family? Yes. But was there problems? Were there things missing in the relationship? Yes. And so the warning in the book of Hebrews seems to be for us. Just knowing about the things of God or being near the things of God does not necessarily mean we're in the rest of God the way he desires. It was true for Israel and brothers and sisters. It can be true for Christians as well. That's the bad news. But beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, we see the good news. Because we don't just see this hard truth, but we see the hope today concerning rest for believers. Hope today concerning rest for believers. Long passage, let me read all of verses 1 through 10, and then we'll work our way through it to understand it together. Therefore, let, it, let us fear, while a promise remains of entering his rest, as any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had the good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, 
and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. He again fixes a certain day, today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has rested has, has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Seems like there's a lot packed in there, so just bear with me for a moment, and I think it will make sense. Notice that he begins chapter 4 with another kind of odd command or warning. Let us fear. Now, we understand the concept of fear in the Bible, and we understand that it's, it's not a bad thing like we often think of it and apply it in our world today. Biblical fear has this idea of being in relationship or knowing one who's basically in control and has authority over us, and we understand that when we disobey him, he has the right and the power to bring consequences to our life. But the difference is the fear that's called for, this holy fear that's called for in that moment should not cause us to run from him, but to run to him, and that's what's being talked about here. Now, this fear that's called for in verse 1 is based on two underlying concepts that in some ways seem contradictory. Let me explain this to you. One is this. The promise for rest is still available. It is still accessible to them and to us. That's the amen part of the sermon, right? We need rest. We're searching for it. Well, good news is God hasn't closed the door yet. It's still open. Now, why is that important? Why does that call for fear? Because it appears that they believed, perhaps, and had judged themselves as having come too late and missed it. The second part of verse 4 says, anyone may seem to have come short of it. A better translation may be something along the lines of, of judged yourself as have, as have come too late or coming too late. Well, what in the world's going on here? Well, remember that it appears that the book of Hebrews was written to a group of Jewish Christians. And these Jewish Christians are in a really hard time, maybe even being persecuted. Say it another way. They feel like they need rest, and they can't find it. And so it appears that maybe intentionally or unintentionally, they are looking and saying, you know what, the rest that we need actually is not found in Christ. It was promised in the Old Testament to the Jews. And so maybe by coming to Christ, we've actually removed ourselves from the rest we need. And so maybe coming to Christ has made us miss that rest, and they're considering going back to it. But God's Word here calls them to fear and not do that because, believe it or not, the rest is still available today to them. They've not missed it. Now, why is that true? Well, look at verse 2. The author says, because in the Old Testament, just like now, they had the promise or the good news of rest preached to them, just like we did. But he said in the Old Testament, it didn't do them any good. Why? Well, because they didn't join the good news that they had had preached to them with faith. Translation, remember, it's a problem of unbelief. It's a problem of unbelief. Now, what good news had they had preached to them? That God gives rest to his people. Now, here's the idea that we see in this passage of Scripture. Ultimately, that rest is still available. Whatever you think, that rest is still available. It, whatever it is, it was and is and is now still available to Day. Well, well, what's his argument that it's available today based on? Well, once more, we go back to it, Psalm 95. But there's something specific about Psalm 95 that he's using as his argument for why this rest is still available. Don't miss it. It is the word today. Today, this rest is still available to you. Now, now why is that the case? Because Psalm 95, which he's attributing to David, and if David wrote it, it means Psalm 90, 95 was written after two very important events in, in the Old Testament that relate to the rest of God. 
First of all, verses 3 through 7. On the seventh day, God rested from his work and called that day holy. Well, guess what was written long after the invitation to rest like God did? Guess what was written to the people of God? Psalm 95. And even after hundreds of years later thinking of the rest of God, guess what the psalmist says? Today this rest is still available to you if you hear his voice and do not harden your heart. So first of all, it's the, it's the seventh day of rest that God did in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. But there's a second important event. They might look and say, but you know what? The ultimate fulfillment of rest that God promised in the Old Testament came when they entered the promised land, and they've already entered the promised land. Remember Joshua, the book of Joshua? Joshua took them into the promised land. And so uh, because of that, again, the promise of rest is in the past. And here again he says, no, look, even Psalm 95 was written after they entered the promised land, and still there was a promise, there was a call for entering rest when? Today. Today. Look, here's what he's doing. He's applying the today from David of Psalm 95 to them and by extension us and saying the promise for rest has not ended. It is still open to you and me today. That's great news. Look how he sums it up. Look at the conclusion he reaches in verses 9 and 10. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. He's taking two concepts of rest in the Old Testament that aren't the same, but he's bringing them together and saying this rest still is open. The rest still remains for the people of God. We might find ourselves asking the question, how can that be? How can that be when he's talking about the Sabbath rest that God initiated and the rest of the promised land that Joshua took him into? How in the world, when we think about it being a day and a place, is the rest of God open to us? Well, here's the answer to that question. I don't want you to miss that. I want you to miss this. Because when we read verses 9 and 10, we should understand, and this is going to be important in just a moment, because the rest of God is not a day. It's not found in a day or in a location. And I think sometimes when we look and we think about God's mighty hand and how he's worked in the past, it's very easy for us to look specifically at Old Testament accounts, and we can begin to believe that that. God's power seems to be diminished amongst us. It's very easy for the church to long for the good old days and think the golden days of Christianity are behind us. It's it's easy for us to think maybe we've come too late to experience all that God has and to say the promises aren't really uh, able to be seen in our lifetime and our existence. But the author of Hebrews, for those that might be believing that, is sounding the trumpet call. Don't want you to miss this because, listen, now is still God's today. Today is still God's today for you and me. And because of that, we are called to fear so that we don't miss it today, which leads us to the final truth that we see in verses 11 through through 13. We don't only just see this hard truth and this hope today. But ultimately, we see the how-to for this rest which is secured in Christ. The how-to for this rest which is secured in Christ. Listen to verses 11 through 13. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the divisions of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with with whom we have to do. Some translations say with whom we have to give an account. You notice that verse 11 begins with a therefore. Why? Well, because it's the conclusion of the argument. Well, what is the argument? Well, the argument is... Even the people of God can can possibly miss this rest. But this rest is still open and available to you today. 
Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest. This concept of diligence carries with it the idea of striving with haste, to, to work for something and to do it now, to do it quickly. Now, here's the amazing thing. Uh, the idea, the application is whatever it is that you think you're looking for, and, and whether it's intentional or, or unintentional, the idea is the answer is not and it's never departing from Christ. As a matter of fact, the idea, if you understand verse 11, is for you to do that would actually to put you on the same path to follow the same example of disobedience that was seen in the Old Testament that caused them to miss rest. So the idea is to strive today to work today, to be diligent today to enter this rest. Now, that leads us, I think, to an important question. Is this where Christianity becomes a hope-so religion? You know, we say, well, we're not saved because us doing some things better or good. And is that what's being taught here, to strive, to work hard, to do it on your own? Well, I don't think that's what's happening at all. Matter of fact, verses 12 and 13 go a long way to show us the reason and the means by which, what our striving or being diligent is based on. Verses 12 and 13 is one of those places in the Bible, in the Word of God, where the Word of God talks about itself, says some characteristics about itself. And it's one of the most famous passages where we see that. And so really what you're seeing here is because of the convicting, the maturing, and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, we are called to be diligent to enter that rest. I wish we had time, but just for a moment or two, look at a few of the characteristics and the conclusion of what we see regarding this statement of the Word of God. First of all, notice that it's referred to, the Word of God is referred to as living. Now, how significant that is? There's no other book that's living. Most books you read, you read it one time. If it's good, you maybe read it again or loan it to a friend and then they forget to give it back to you. Or you sit it on a shelf and it does nothing but collect dust, right? That's what happens. Well, that's not so the Bible. Every time we, re we open it, not only are we reading it, but it's reading us. But notice that he doesn't just say that it's living, but he says it's active. This carries with it the idea of being energetic or accomplishing purposes. Understand that the Word of God, it's not just that it contains truths, and it does, but it also accomplishes purposes. It accomplishes things in our life. Maybe you remember very well Isaiah 55, 11, where we read that the Word of God does not return void, but it accomplishes every purpose for which God sent it out. This is the idea that's being carried here. God's Word is active. And then finally, we see that the metaphor of a double-edged sword is used to describe the Word of God. Most scholars will tell you that that is not probably the best translation of the concept that's being yet used here, a double-edged sword. Why? Well, because cause most swords that were used as a weapon in that day and time actually didn't have a double edge. But two things that did have a double edge was a doctor's scalpel and a priest's knife that would be used to slay the sacrifice, sacrificial animal, which perhaps is where we get into what we see next. It divides between joint and marrow, a doctor doing surgery, and between soul and spirit, the work, spiritually speaking, of God through the priest in our life. But the idea is it affects and it applies to the whole man. The Word of God certainly relates to our salvation and our spiritual life, but it also relates to the way we live, which gets to the point of the call of this passage, doesn't it? What's really fascinating is, is how it ends and ultimately who it puts us in the presence of. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There is some argument over what is meant by this concept of laid bare. It, it's a word that means to pull the throat back. Some people will say that it's a wrestler's move where they put someone in a chokehold. Some will say, no, it's what a captor would do to a captee and putting a dagger under their chin and holding their face up. But the idea is either way, you cannot hide your eyes. 
You cannot hide your eyes, but your eyes have to be up, up and it brings you face to face with ultimately your God. You are exposed face to face before him. Ultimately, the one to whom we have to give an account. Dare we say, the one who is ultimately the great physician of our soul and the good high priest of our salvation. That's who we are laid bare before. I've been told, and by the way, he was watching the 930 service, and he texted me in between and said, you're exactly right. I was told when I was growing up that my dad actually and literally had a pet raccoon when he was a little boy. Now, I told, that, that just seems strange to me. Now, he lived out in the country, and so they had room for that. But that just seems like the strangest thing in the world. Like, kids, don't get any ideas. You're not getting a pet raccoon. But it's my understanding that raccoons actually aren't that hard to catch. There is a foolproof trap that you can easily create. All you have to do is to get a box or a bottle that has a small opening in it and put like a cube of sugar in the bottom and then put two nails facing downward on each side. The raccoon's hand will go in. It's large enough to go by, but when they grab the, the cube of sugar and make a fist, it will not allow it to come back out. You would say, well, easy enough to let go of the sugar. Well, that would seem to be the case, but everything I know about raccoons is they will never, not in a million years, let go of the piece of sugar. They will keep themselves trapped there forever, even when the, when the, the nails are poking into their, their hand. You say, what in the world does that have to do with your sermon and what we've just seen in Hebrews chapter 4? Well, I wonder if sometimes the point is not that the very Word of God pierces and pokes into our soul and gives us a steady reminder that our souls have a longed-for rest that can only be met in Jesus and that we've got to let go and we've got to receive Him and only what He brings. The problem is when that word pierces a lot of us, and maybe many of us, our natural reaction is not to run towards Jesus, but it's to run away from him. But here, we're being told that our diligence to enter rest should be a call to look to Christ. With that in mind, just a few applications, and then I will give you the spiritual principle as we conclude this morning. Four applications that I think will make sense as we work our way to this spiritual principle. Number one, based on all of this, as we begin to ask the question, what is rest? Here's what we have to say. In the Bible and in the book of Hebrews, rest is not simply a metaphor for salvation, but shows the relationship between salvation and continuing to walk with God. Now, how do I know that? Well, one is because of this passage, but number two, let's just take Moses for a moment. Did Moses make it into the promised land? No. But was he a part of the covenant people of God? Yes. But did he even his disobedience and rebellion cause him to miss something sweeter that God had for him? Yes. And we can be in the same dangers. We're not careful. Secondly, we need to understand that rest is not a call to inactivity, but to a specific or special kind of activity. Well, how do I know that? Well, think about the pattern of God in the Old Testament when he rested from his work. Does that mean God stopped and never again did anything? No, God is still very much active. He's just not creating the world anymore. Instead, his activity starts to focus on his relationship with those in the world he's created. Listen, when we talk about resting, we don't mean doing nothing. Spiritual rest means doing something. It just means focusing on God and his holiness. Which leads back to an application that something I brought up a while ago or that arose a while ago. Is this rest still available to us? Yes, because ultimately rest is not found in a day or a place, in a day or a location. That's why it's still available to us because, listen, friend, rest for us is found and fulfilled in a person, Jesus Christ. Jesus is where our rest comes from, and Jesus is our rest. Walking with him, growing in him, knowing him, and worshiping him day after day. Which leads us to the spiritual principle that we see at play in this passage. There is a call to guard your heart against unbelief and disobedience, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to guard your heart against unbelief and disobedience, even as a believer, so that you do not miss 
the rest that only Christ gives. Now, the book of Hebrews, truths sometimes come to us by way of a warning, sometimes by way of an encouragement. This is a warning, but even in the warning, there is a promise. If you're called to guard your heart so that you don't miss the rest, what does that mean? The rest is available to you today. I told you that when I think about the spiritual rest that I need, one incident comes to my mind above all others, and that was when I was saved, but there's a close second that follows closely behind it. Shortly after I was saved, when I was 12 years old, for the next four years, because of some circumstances and events in my life, I really wasn't in church. After I was saved, I really wasn't in church, so I didn't, I didn't mature in Christ. I was around other believers. No discipleship happened. And I will tell you, my life was just adrift. I didn't know it at the time, but my soul needed rest. I've said it like this often. During that time when I look back, I was a ship at sail by the power of my own wind. And that is not very effective. As a matter of fact, you talk about directionless. But then when I was 16, I had a friend of mine invite me to Wednesday night church. And very quickly after that, I was reminded, reminded of the goodness of Christ, the sweetness of who he is, and the growth that occurs only for him, from him. And very soon after that, my soul found the rest for which it had longed unknowingly. How about you? Now, this shouldn't surprise us because it's exactly what Jesus himself said in Matthew 11, isn't it? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle, I'm humble and gentle in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. I wonder how many of you today need rest. And I wonder if you've been trying to carry it on your own. And Jesus is saying, stop trying to carry it. Let me carry it. Or better yet, let him carry you. Now, this morning, today. Would you pray with me? As we move into a time of invitation, a time of response, I would just ask you today if you would consider coming and receiving the rest that only Christ provides. Maybe that's initial salvation or maybe that's just some burden that you're carrying. Maybe it's joining a church. Maybe it's being baptized. Maybe it's just you need somebody to pray with you. I'll be up front and would love to meet with you. I'm going to pray when I say amen. We're going to begin to respond. Gracious Father, thank you so much for this word and its truth. But more than that, thank you for the Savior that it points to in whom only true rest is found. Help us to be those today that accept and take up and follow your true rest. We love you. We need you. We give you this time and pray that you would have your way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand together as we sing?
man, hasn't it been good to be together in the house of the Lord, worshiping Him and gathered as a church family this morning? Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for all of you for being here today. And specifically, if now wasn't the right time for you to respond, but something's still in your heart, we want to give you a chance to do that. I and some of the ministry staff will be around. We'll have people at the Info Hub out in the foyer, so please stop by. Or you can even text CONNECT sometime later this week to the number that's on the screen, and somebody from our staff would love to reach out and connect with you. With all that in mind, as we think about concluding today, as I was thinking about the benediction, I can't think of anything that would be better to be spoken over us as a blessing more than the theme of the day that we've already experienced that, again, comes to us from that passage I just quoted in Matthew chapter 11. So I'm going to end by once more reminding us of the words of our Savior, and with this we will be dismissed into His blessing and into His rest. Remember, we hear him say, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble and gentle in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God bless you. Have a great Sunday and be blessed.